Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Andrew. Welcome back. I haven't seen you guys in so long. It's the holiday season, so I take a little break with the family, but I wanted to come back and give you guys some more videos. So if you've been watching my videos from the start, you know that I'm talking about the basics of I am. And the last video we talked about was RBAC. Did you know that when you look for jobs that have RBAC in the description or qualifications, how many jobs do you think you'll see? A couple hundred? Would you be surprised if I said around 1,800? And I got this from LinkedIn's job description. So it was amazing about the amount of jobs that had RBAC in it. And in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about the different methods of finding roles and what we call role mining. See couple, stay tuned. Hey folks, it's Andrew here at All Things I Am. And today we're gonna to talk about role mining and the two different approaches when it comes to finding roles. What was interesting about this video that I want to make was in throughout the entire year of 2021, I've interviewed a fair amount of candidates. And these candidates came from people such as I am engineers, to I am developers, to even I am consultants like myself. And a lot of times I love to think about or ask some questions about our back. And my normal questions I would ask in interviews is, so tell me how you would find roles when it comes to our back. And I would get the standard simple answer that many would provide to me, which is, oh, I would look at the access that requested today and just do it and data analysis from there. And I go, oh, okay, so something like a service now. And they're like, yeah, something like a service now. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting, cool, makes sense. But what if you didn't have that data, right? What if you had a company that didn't have that entry point, that service now, or some other mechanism to let managers request roles? What would you do? And nine out of 10 times, it would stump them. And I was surprised by that because these people put in their resume years of implementing RBAC. So I was surprised to you know, have that response from them. So that really made me want to prompt to make this video too, was to talk about that and the different approaches because I expected people with 10, maybe even eight years of IM experience to understand the different methods when it comes to role mining or RBAC. So in this video, again, I'm gonna to talk to you about those two approaches. What are those two approaches? So the two approaches that I'm gonna talk about is top-down analysis and then on, of course, bottom-up analysis. Now, this will be a long video if I made a video on both of the approaches. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this down into two separate videos. First video, which is today, I'm gonna to talk about the top-down analysis. So it comes to top-down analysis, what you wanna think about is you want to think about from the analysis of the organization itself. So in this effort, what you're doing, what you're gonna do is you're going to actually talk to your stakeholders, your managers, your department leads, and kind of ask them questions. And a couple of the questions you're gonna ask them is, how do you provide roles today? What do you do? So you would interview these people and ask them, so if you had somebody that just started today, how would you give them permissions? What would you do? And like I said earlier in this video, sometimes ServiceNow is the entry way of getting that, but maybe sometimes it's, oh, I'm gonna email HR, or not HR, excuse me, I'm gonna email the service desk and say, hey, here's what I wanna do, or maybe they use like some kind of form, like Google Forms or even SharePoint to really look at that and say, hey, you know what, I want these six or seven roles for John, for example, and then I submit them, maybe they go through an approval process, and then once that's done, it gets approved, and then service desk or some IT entity will go in and provision those accounts. Now, when you do these interviews, we kind of want to sit there and just watch them. What do you do? Write down the write down their process, and then really the big question that, that I want you to get out of this is ask them, what's your pain points? What are some things that really frustrate you when it comes to providing permissions? Some common ones that I've seen in my career are it takes too long. I have somebody who wants to start day one and they're sitting there going, hmm, you know what, I don't, I don't have my access yet, so I'm gonna read something. And I've said this before in many of my other videos that that could be the case. And it's true, it happens from time to time. Another thing that I've noticed too, or some of the pain points that I get is, you know what, these permissions that they give me, they're just too complex. Or I don't really know what they mean. And again, very common. There are times 
where you go to organizations and they give you whatever it, whatever Act Directory says, right? And it could be something that's very foreign. I recently just did an exercise with a healthcare company. And when we did the exercise with them to talk about what roles should we assign to, let's say, new nurses, the managers did not understand exactly what any of these permissions or what we call them entitlements really meant because they weren't business friendly. So that's another common issue that we have today is not friendly or not business friendly permissions or entitlements. So when you talk to them, jot down these pain points. And then the third thing that I see common, and it's not as common as it's before, but it does happen from time to time, is they want to do something called mirroring. Mirroring is really just saying, give me what he has. And that is a big no-no in, in IAM because the problem is it's not only lazy, but you could be giving somebody too much access than they, what they originally had. And that's a problem because if John, who is, let's say, a IT supervisor, has all, has all these other permissions that maybe give him more access to things, such as, let's say, approving timesheets versus, let's say, me, Andrew here, maybe I'm just a mid-level IT person or maybe I'm just a database engineer that works under you know John. Should I really get what John has? No, I shouldn't. So the problem is, is we want to really focus on, or in I am what we like to call it is least privilege. Least privilege is giving access to the person to just do their job or just enough. Nothing more, nothing less. And again, if John at up there, who's my manager, and there's me in the middle here, I really shouldn't have what John has, right? I shouldn't have the ability to, let's say, approve timesheets because that could be a violation or I'm not senior enough to do it or that's not my job. And the, another problem that happens when you do mirroring is what, what if I transfer jobs? What if I transfer different apartments? Should I still have those access to those or should I not have it, right? And that's a narrow common problem. And what the biggest issue we get down the line is you have somebody who, let's say John, who's been there for, let's say, 30 years and dude has been inheriting, inheriting, inheriting roles. He might have so much roles that you don't know what to do. Or when you do certifications, what does he really need to do, right? You're a manager. You might have no idea. So we don't want to mirror. And that is a common problem that when you interview people, you're going to see that. So when it comes to interviewing people, what I suggest we do is we don't do enterprise-wise. It'll take you forever. Pick a certain department and let's show some value on the get-go. So what you would do is talk to your project manager or your stakeholder or your champion and say, you know what, give me an apartment that, that is more, that's willing to talk to us, right? Let's make an example. Let's say, let's say IT, right? Or better, let's do service desk, service desk. So service desk, again, you want to talk to maybe the supervisor of the, of the help desk and say there are probably, what, three tiers of help desk? level one, level two, level three, or tiers as they call it, and say, what does tier one need to do? What does tier two do? What does tier three do? What are those permissions or what application do they have access to today? And how do you grant them? So you write those down and you kind of build some data around that. Another method you want to think about is maybe you sit there and mirror the person, or not, excuse me, not mirror, bad, <laughs> not mirroring. Uh, you want to just like, watch them, you know, in a day in life, right? So let's say a day in life in a, on a, tier two help desk person and write down what do they, what do they do in terms of access, what are some of the permissions that, that they do, and then maybe next day you want to watch a tier one and then look at the differences. You know, Do they share common application access somewhere or maybe are there certain software applications they have access to but within the application itself, maybe there are separate levels or permissions or even let's say menus that maybe a tier two person can see and a tier one person cannot see. So again, you're gathering data when it comes to a top-down analysis to build those roles and say, okay, what is those that are common across the board and maybe what's unique to a specific job title or even department. So once you've done gathering your data, what do you want to do? So what I, I do and it's common is I use the Paleo rule, right? Which is 80-20. So when you gather your data from all your interviews, maybe again a day in life, and then you, you might have actually access to all the ServiceNow requests to get that, you would take and go, okay, looking at the department on the top level, what does everybody have? Or what does 80% of those people have? And then when you see those, you build your role off of that. And then once you're done building those roles off of the 80-20 rule, what you want to think about is, okay, of these 80% of the common access, 
I'll make those roles. The last 20%, I'll keep those separate or what we call requestable roles or requestable entities or not, excuse me, entitlements. And then what you do is you go and you show them to your uh, stakeholder, right? Or even the department lead and say, hey, look, based on my analysis, here's what I found. I found that of all your people, 80% of them get this. So we should consider making this a role. And them knowing the department, knowing the access that they should be granting, they might agree with you or they might say, you know what? Out of that 20% that you've, you've uh, removed, I've noticed that I should be requesting a little bit more than the common. So let's bring that up, right? Again, you want to engage your stakeholders and really talk to them and be flexible, right? There's not, there's not really a, a strict 8% rule is you use that as your starting point. Here's what we found. Let's talk about it. And then let's adjust accordingly. And then once you get buy-in and you say, you know what? This makes sense. Boom. Then you go and create your roles and then you have your automated roles. So what that means is when you have people that start, let's say day one, and you're a part of this department, and let's say you're, you're in department service desk. Again, all service desk people, regardless of tiers, will get this role that gives them access that everybody has across the board. Saves you time. A person's working from day one and you know what that role is built off of. So you know that you're only giving a person the amount of access they need to do to do their job. Now, once you build your roles though, you wanna think about other things too. So one thing that I want to bring up is something called segregation of duties. And I might have said that before in my earlier videos, but really there are, these are policies, right? So let's take our example again of service desk. So in service desk, you have your service desk lead, you have your tier two, tier three, and tier one. But what if your supervisor has same rights they may be inherited? And let's go back to our last video where you might have somebody who is takes that and they do the hierarchy or the inheritance, right? That since I'm a lead, I get everything that tier two has, tier three has, and tier one has, all their permissions. But what if within those specific permissions, there are some things that conflict? And what I mean by that is if I'm a tier three, right, and I can access everything tier two and tier one, but what if I give a little bit more than I should? Wouldn't it be really odd or suspect if you have the ability to edit and submit and change your own time sheets or maybe even approve your expense reports? That could be bad, right? And that does happen from time to time. So again, when you talk to your stakeholders and you ask them these questions, ask about their policies saying, hey, look, do you guys have segregation of duty policies? And they might go, what does that mean? And just give them a simple question like, look, do you have specific permissions that are really against the rules? And what I like to do, and a lot of people do it too, is a common accounts payable, accounts receivable. And I made the example earlier about if I can not only submit and edit my timesheets, or excuse me, edit my special reports, what if I can also prove them too? That's a no-no, right? Because again, what if I'm, adding more things that are really against company policy. And a common example is this. You go out to a customer site and you go and eat dinner, right? A lot of companies today, when it comes to expense reports, you can't expense or you can't put alcohol on the on your expense report, right? That's a separate transaction that usually is against the rules. You have the ability to edit and submit your own timesheets, but approve them too. You What stopped you from putting alcohol on there and getting more money than you should be, right? And that's against the rules. And there's no really oversight. So when you create your roles in the top-down analysis and you ask these questions, ask them about segregation duties, ask them about the different policies they have today and say, hey, what are ones that really that, if you're a specific job group, or you're maybe you're in a different department, right? What are some, what are some permissions that you shouldn't have because they, they basically conflict each other? And that's how you build your segregation of duties. So when you create your roles, when it comes to your RBAC from top down analysis point of view, you make sure to keep those in mind. So again, if somebody comes in and they're hired, let's say a one department, that these are these SOD violations or these policies are really enforced, that if some, for some reason the person changes positions within the department, that they know that they have per specific permissions or entitlements already, they say there's maybe your, your IGA system or your identity system who say, nope, that's not happening, conflict, or you notify somebody of that conflict. And that's a good start to at least keep your systems clean, know who has the high risky 
permissions or entitlements, but also know who who is it that maybe you say, oh, I know that these six people have violations. Let me go and fix that. And then make sure that with, when you have an audit, for example, you have those people, you know who they are, you know that basically you've, you've mitigated that risk. So you know that these people can't do both duties that could cause trouble or be unethical. And like I always say in a lot of my videos, keep you away from being on the cover of the Washington Post, um, which if you're a public trading company, costs you a lot of money. Actually, big into that one. They'll, they'll, they'll let you know how much that, that costs them in terms of, of uh, stock shares. All right, and that's pretty much it in terms of some top-down analysis. Again, I gave you a high-level overview of it. There is more information there, and I'll link that down in the description of a couple of references that you can kind of look at to get a better idea of the top-down analysis approach. Next video, we're gonna talk about bottom-up analysis, which is more back-end, understanding the application, seeing the actual data of people, and some of this information, or when you do bottom-up analysis, it's gonna require some coding. Ah, you know what? Not coding, bad word. It's gonna require you to basically do some, let's say, SQL joins, bring tables together, and kind of build that picture when it comes to, okay, here's John Smith, here's their department, here's different tables that I brought together to paint the picture when it comes to what their access is or what permission they have based on a job title or a department, for example. And I'll use that more next time in our next video. And that'll be a little bit more PowerPoint driven because I think that's much easier to understand versus just seeing me here talking to you. So thank you so much for watching. I really hope you had, you had a good, good time here. You had some great information that I wanted to share with you. Um, people transitioning, I hope this helps you in terms of being prepared for interviews. And as always, Thank you so much. Stay curious because you never know. I'll see you soon.